All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of Men in Stripes, brought to you by StripeHype.com, an official website site of Fan Sided. Really excited, a lot of news to finally talk about for the first time in a while. Tim Daniel here, excited for another awesome show, bringing another than my excellent co-host, my crazy sidekick, who has held it down while I was gone for a couple weeks, Mr. Matthew Wilson. Matthew, thanks for coming. How are we doing? Doing good. Welcome back. Yeah. Was it two, three weeks? Two weeks. Yeah. You know, seen... Yeah, two weeks in a row without you. Yeah. Had some things I had to take care of, but, you know, things happen. And work, life, you know how that goes. Yeah, St. Patrick's Day tournament, all that fun stuff. St. Patty's Day tournament, ooh. Yeah. Between that and the draft, you're gonna be you're gonna be like well uh, well known around pretty much the Midwest. Yeah, you're probably right there. <laughs> uh, first off, because I did this at the end of the show last time, mm-hmm. forget this at the beginning of the show. We have an email address now. Oh. It is men in stripes sh at gmail dot com. Whoa, we're like official and stuff now. We are, and this is so that people can actually email us questions. Maybe we can do a mailbag segment. That'd be cool. Do we get any luck this week? Uh, as I said, we did at the end. Ah, so, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, yeah, we the people that make it to the end are probably too tired to actually even <laughs> email us anything because they probably have fell asleep. No, uh, <laughs> Matt did a great job last week. Sean did a great job two weeks ago. So. Uh, we, we held it down for sure. Awesome. So, anyway, let's get right into the news of free agency. So, uh, Bengals been a little busy the past couple of days, obviously. Um, looks like the other day, there, you know, we had Brandon LaFell in come to visit last week, and then yesterday some reports come out that he is working, negotiating a contract with the team. And yep. then we find out today that Carlos Dansby, who last week said he would love to play for the Bengals, is in town for a visit. So, Looks yep. like we've been waiting for a couple of weeks of when the heck are they going to make a move? When are they going to go after some players? And it looks like that's uh, finally starting to happen. One thing we can say is it's about freaking time. Um, for sure. I mean, the Bengals needed to make some moves. And uh, especially, you know, linebacker was one that we kind of have been questioning. And we know that uh, now um, all the reports that Taylor uh, Mays was supposed to be coming back and supposed to have agreed to an, a deal. And then three days after that announcement, uh, Jeff Hobson brings out in one of his articles that contract talks are positive, but there was nothing officially signed. So uh, we have learned that that isn't as close to a deal as we thought. Mm-hmm. So, uh, definitely some outsiders coming in, maybe putting a little pressure on Taylor Mays to get something done, especially Dansby. Well, let's be honest here. In this circumstance, would you rather have Dansby or Taylor Mays? Oh, absolutely, Taylor. Or I'd, I'd rather I was going to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, <laughs> I absolutely would rather have Dansby. But at the same time, I mean, you're also talking about Taylor Mays knows the system already. Mm-hmm. So in some ways, he would – have less of a learning curve than Dansby would have, but Taylor Mays is four games suspended. Right. So the big thing there then would be four games suspended. Dansby's not. Dansby can help this team when they need it, and that's in the first three weeks. Mm, yeah. Um, oh, I mean, it goes further than that, but, yeah. you know, it, it, the big factor in terms of looking at some of these higher outside guys would be Vontez perfect suspension for the first three games. There's that. There's um, how healthy will Vinny Ray be? How healthy will Ray Malou be? Yes. Um, there's which they just stayed pretty well last last year, so we might be on uh, borrowed time. There's what the hell's the game plan with PJ Dawson? Something that they probably should have already addressed by now, but yeah. And then is Marquise Flowers going to come back healthy? That's another thing you got to wonder about there. Can Vontez Perfect uh, avoid concussion? Will A.J. Hawk be a Bengal next year? Well, yeah, that too. Yeah. But, but uh, you you know my feeling on that one. Yes, I do. And that's, a, that's a yes, and we know your feeling on that one, and that's really? <laughs> yeah, I'm not 100% sure on that, honestly. That's what kind of makes the little part interesting there. Uh, there's something, you know, Dancy brings a lot to the table. Um, mm-hmm. I don't blame him. You know, his point was, you know, I want to play for a Super Bowl contender. And this team is certainly yeah. that, uh, even with the losses, with a couple of guys that went out here and there. I think he's a guy that can really step in there and really fill in a solid role for this team as an outside, as a veteran linebacker. 
Absolutely. No, uh, Dinsby is somebody who knows the AFC North well, obviously, being mm-hmm. that he is from the uh, team up north, and I am not referring to Michigan this time. Um, so uh, you, you know that that means that the uh, other team up north would be the uh, uh, Dog Pound, and uh, our, our guys over at Dog Pound Daily do a great job of covering them. But at the same time, as we kind of picked on Cleveland last uh, last week, Siri is even trolling the Cleveland Browns. So that should tell you a new low. Yeah, that's absolutely there. Um, <laughs> let's flip on the other side of the field. So Jones is yep. gone. Sanu is gone. Uh, first name that comes up there is Brandon LaFell. Um, a lot of people have the argument, you know, should they go after Brandon LaFell? Should they go after Jeremy Curley? Um, you know, we've had the discussion off there about what Brandon LaFell really brings to the table. Personally, if they're able to get this deal done, if Brandon LaFell lines up for this team next year, I still say you go get a wide receiver in the first round. Um, but if you can, if you have a cookie, you know, put Coleman, Fuller, Thomas, any of those guys in there, LaFell and A.J. Green, along with Tyler Eifert, that's a really solid stack there. I think he brings a lot to this team as far as that speed goes. I know he battled some injuries last year with New England, but you know in the New England Super Bowl run, he was a huge part of that offense there. Uh, he was a huge part of Carolina his couple years he was there also. So you got to think that Brandon LaFell is a guy that could really come into this team and contribute as long as he's on the field. Yeah, I mean, the one thing he's got to fix is the drops, but I'm more shocked about the fact you said Coleman before Fuller. Well, I know. I know. <laughs> I didn't even mention Josh Doxson. You didn't mention him, or, and you didn't mention uh, even uh, Treadwell. I think he'll be gone by the time the Bengals pick. Well, I do too, but at the same time, you would be we would be a fool to even sit there and say that he's not, at least at this point, a possibility right. until he's taken that draft board. Yeah, I think that's fair. So, um, but then again, that's the editorial side of me sitting there going, well, what, are the, what does everybody else need and what are they looking at? Because it could fall perfectly that maybe, say – the unknown happens and, and AJ Hawk falls a little bit further. And all of a sudden um, I think Gi- maybe the giants were one of them kind of looking towards another receiver to help out. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm trying to think of everybody they had kind of in front of them. Um, but Yeah. I mean, but say AJ Hawk falls and all of a sudden uh, the giants pick up AJ Hawk and then somebody falls because AJ Hawk fell. And that means that Houston goes, Oh, you know what? We need one of those. He's a little bit better player. He meets our need and he can play immediately. So, I mean, there's always these scenarios that play in, and we don't know. Maybe the Bengals do the unknown and trade up to go get them. I doubt it's going to happen, but it's still a possibility. So, um, off the treadmill thing. Uh, but, yeah, no, I, I think they they if they bring in Brandon LaFell, first and foremost, Brandon LaFell does need to hold on the ball, as we've talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've talked about even last week with – I talked about with Matt, uh, Matt Rosa is – uh, he had 50% completion last year. Mm-hmm. Okay, we know that. But if you look at just one year ago, um, in 2014, when the, the Patriots made their Super Bowl run, won the Super Bowl, he was his, his production actually almost matched Marvin Jones. Yeah. And so he had 79 completions, I think, on, I think it was 79, on 119 targets. He had 950-some yards. He had nine touchdowns. He had one fumble. So, I mean, he's for having possession of the ball 79 times, one fumble, that's pretty good percentage it is. Uh, for ball handling. So uh, the big thing there is, yes, he had his issues last year, but so did pretty much the Patriots. And if you look at all the distractions around him, everybody asking about um, – because the offense was the key. So even the receivers were getting, well, how did you, uh, did you, did you know the balls were deflated? Did you feel the balls being, they had all these distractions in front of them. So who's to say that he just didn't have his mind in the right focus. Joining a new team gives him a fresh start and potentially puts him back on pace to be in that wide receiver to at least kind of mentality to where he's back to that form. Not saying he would be the number two wide receiver, he might be the number three, but at the same time, the production that he has put out, even with the 50% completion ratio, I think he had over 500 yards this year. So you're telling me you won't take that as a Bengals fan? Oh, absolutely. Um, so, Yeah, like I said, I think he fits in really well there, and I think he's a guy you can definitely be excited about there for sure. 
Uh, let's go ahead and get a reset here real fast. We are Men in Stripes, brought to you by StripeHype.com, uh, fan side network where you can check us on YouTube and iTunes and a few other places. We continue to do this show each and every week throughout the off season. Um, other news that came out today, you know, I can touch base on. I know some of the smaller, uh, I shouldn't say smaller guys because I know football players are actually small, but some of the uh, little additions, you know, the teams kind of bringing back some players to, re- to re-sign and kind of keep this, uh, the depth going there. Um, last week was Pat Sims. I'm sure you guys kind of touched on that a little bit on his two-year deal. Yep. And then uh, today we find out Brandon Thompson's coming back. Uh, looks like they signed a one-year deal with him. Yep. I like the idea of bringing him back. I do still think, you know, Hardison has a little more upside than Thompson, especially with the ACL industry and I really ACL injury. And I really do like Marcus Hardison a lot. Um, just curious your thoughts there, you know, what he brings here. Do you think that the, this is another, just a body in camp, maybe? Do you think this is a guy they expect to be on the roster next year? Well, I mean, one thing that he does bring is he brings still some kind of youth. I mean, he's only 26 years old. He has potential. That's crazy. Um, he is, I haven't seen the exact details of his contract. I don't know if they're out there. Um, but uh, even then, when you think about it, it's probably not for much more than than veteran minimum. Maybe it is a is a little more. Um, but at the same time, you bring back somebody who knows the system, somebody who has at least, from what we've seen, done okay at filling in for um, Demata Pecco and for Geno Atkins and for the guys up um, in the tackle spot, and so. Again, somebody who knows the system, somebody who can be an asset in case of the emergency situation of somebody having to be thrown in early. Um, I do think he makes the roster. Uh, he might be a, another one of those bubble players that we kind of have to keep in a close eye on. But, again, I think his uh, his knowledge of this team and this play, uh, this playbook, uh, bode well for him. They do, and I think we've seen before with this Marvin Lewis system. He likes to bring guys in or keep guys that know the system, um, i.e. Michael Johnson, but that was just a perfect situation to bring him back last year. Uh, Yeah, so I think the Thompson really plays that part there. I still feel, you know, I kind of mentioned a few seconds ago, if it comes down to Brandon Thompson, again, you know, injury with the injury, the ACL, which I understand, you know, is great. The Bengals took great care of him when he got hurt last year. Probably could have been a nice extra body to have in that Pittsburgh game in the playoffs. But I still feel like there's a little more Marcus Hardison that they should be on this team than Brandon Thompson's circumstance. Uh, maybe Marcus Hardison just, you know, he wasn't, he didn't play at all last year. He was inactive. He made the 53 man. Um, I didn't see a down of play. Uh, I don't know if that's, you know, just too many bodies there. I don't know if that's not knowing the system. Um, but, you know, the other option here is I mean, a guy that's kind of been up and down as far as being active and active is what's play the situation. You have three guys, you keep two. You have Thompson, you have Hardison, and you have Marcus Hunt. You bat, you went through all three of those guys being active and inactive throughout the whole year last year. You get to pick two of those three. Who do you keep? I I keep Hardison and I keep uh, Thompson. I agree. I I mean, we we've seen Hunt. He it's not like he's been a abysmal, but I think. He's had his opportunities, and I think we've seen that basically – I think we've seen probably the best of him, in, at least in the Bengals system. Not to say he won't succeed in somebody else's. Not to say he wouldn't succeed in a 4-3 type system, mm-hmm. especially when you add – you know, you have a total of five rushers with the two linebacking edge rushers. Um, he might succeed a little more than that being, being in a nose tackle type position. But um, – I just don't think the 4-3 system is his system, or at least the Bengals' 4-3 system is his system. So um, I'd have to say uh, I'd have to say he is the weakest link. Goodbye. Um, yeah, I agree. I think he's athletic as hell, and I think he's certainly yeah. shown that, obviously. Um, but really, other than being there to block field goals, I don't really know what he brings. Um, you know, he's athletic. He, you know, he's very fast. He looks good off the line, but. It's very rare he gets off the line, and that's the part that really concerns me there. Uh, on that same point, you know, the fact that Marcus Hunt's on this team, and that, you know, for some reason, Gunther and Lewis love the guy, do you think that might play a part in why Wallace Gilberry is not back with the Bengals yet? I think it plays a part. And not to mention, I mean, the big thing you see with Wallace Gilberry, though, I mean, 
what he's a, he is a um, I mean he's a defensive end obviously they have Michael Johnson in place they have um, they have their guys there Carlos Dunlap mm-hmm. um, I mean Will Clark yeah I mean the big thing there is I think they look at Wallace Gilberry and they say okay how much does he want and I think from Wallace Gilberry's side I think Wallace Gilberry feels that he is a starting defensive end I think that's fair and, in, and I think in Cincinnati he knows he's not a starting defensive end. And so um, Marcus Hunt is good, but I think Will Clark has at least earned his look. I agree. I think Will Clark is a very – I mean, he's very athletic, very very football IQ st- uh, strong there. I think, you know, he could really play a part with more reps, obviously, too. Um, but yeah. these aren't exactly bad problems to have to be contemplating, which – young, inexperienced defensive players you want to have on your D-line as you continue to grow with this team? No, absolutely. And, I mean, it's kind of the it's kind of the conundrum of, you know, who's who's the worst of the best or who's the worst of at least the up-and-coming? So mm-hmm. you can't really be down on that. No, no not by any stretch. <laughs> so... But um, kind of moving into a little bit more of, uh, you know, and, and we kind of, I think we, I mean, we've barely touched on it, and, and that's the fact that um, I, I haven't gotten your opinion on it yet. Obviously, I, uh, people kind of know mine with the articles and everything coming out, but the whole Taylor Mays thing, mm-hmm. being signed, not being signed, um, obviously, Rand Getlin from my NFL Network jumping the gun, um, making me jump the gun, making everybody jump the gun. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I kept watching, waiting for the, you know, the official signing and the picture of him in the boardroom signing, and uh, you know, so that way I could get off of uh, Jason Markham's case over at uh, Cincy Jungle, because uh, I have been on his case. I've, I've even been on. Uh, uh, I've been on Connor's case too about it because um, I think that I was sitting there going, we're going off of a hunch and we're saying he signed and confirming the signature. We've got nothing from either side. Right. Uh, but the, then the question is, number one, kind of going back to that, is that somebody that that they should? No. Okay. And that's my feeling too. But at the same time, you know, do you think that he brings an asset to this team, or do you think it's just kind of one of those we've waited so long for him to actually do something? He kind of did something in Oakland, but then he kind of screwed it up with this whole substance thing. He's – my – oh, man, this is going to sound very very Notre Dame of me when I dog Taylor Mays, isn't it? Uh, you you sound Notre Dame every week when you bring up Will Fuller, so keep – just go. <laughs> <laughs> the thing with Taylor Mays is just like, you know – he he can hit you really hard, but he's not always hitting the right guy. Uh, he's never in the right place when he's playing on the defensive side. He's a really good special teams player. Um, mm-hmm. I really appreciate that about him there. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen Taylor Mays in coverage, and I go, oh, God, oh, man. And he's just, you know, he gets burned a lot. For a guy that, you know, when he was coming out of SC, he was, he was the best safety in college football. You know, he's up there with USC safeties with Troy Polamalu, and you're like, he's not Troy Polamalu at all. Let's calm that down. Um, yep. Plus, like, this is a guy that even though he's only played six NFL seasons, he's technically been a member of San Francisco, seven teams. Yep. So he doesn't stick well anywhere, um, especially this, off, this past offseason. He was a member of three teams before the season even started. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't think he really brings anything back to this team. And I get the idea of him being the nickel linebacker and filling it for that spot that Emmanuel Amur is leaving apart where I go into Minnesota. But again, what is wrong with P.J. Dawson? What is wrong with uh, Marquise Flowers? Hell, what the, wrong, what the hell is wrong with Jason DeMonch? Like, what, why, what do those three guys not bring to the table that Taylor Mays does to make them think he should be back here? You stumped me. No, I, I mean, honestly, I have no clue. Um, I mean, you, you've said it pretty well there. Uh, Taylor Mays is, I think he's had his opportunities. Right. I think he has screwed up. 
um, each one of those opportunities. It's not to say that he isn't talented, and that's not, not what we're saying at all, but he almost always seems to underperform. We know what he can do. We've seen it in preseason a number of times, and we always think, you know, hey, Taylor Mays is actually going to do something this year, and we thought that for so long, and all of a sudden, Taylor Mays didn't do something. So it's almost kind of like he squandered his opportunities with the Bengals at this point. He had an opportunity to be a, a really strong safety, and George Iloka came out. Yep. I mean, everybody kind of thought that, you know, between George Iloka and Taylor Mays, that Taylor Mays was going to be, okay, that next guy. And all of a sudden, George Iloka appears out of nowhere and goes, hi, my name's George Iloka. I'm your next uh, strong safety. And he's the and, man. And, and he is, and, and rightfully so. He's back in a Bengals uniform, and he's back where he should be. Um, obviously, Reggie Nelson, we'd love to have him back. I mean, mm-hmm. there's also talks because he hasn't signed anywhere. Is you know maybe he might come back, especially since he's shown some interest in other or other teams have shown some interest in him, but nobody is stepping to kind of go okay, let's do something about it, or at least nobody has done enough about it that has made Reggie Nelson's camp feel comfortable with signing. So the Bengals may be in a good position to even kind of go Taylor Mays, Reggie Nelson, or Taylor Mays and Carlos Dansby. Um, and, and so, you know, we don't know what's happening on those talks as well, obviously, because uh, Bengals do, for the most part, keep things behind closed doors as we see with this Taylor Mays thing. Mm-hmm. It hasn't happened. People kind of jumped the gun with sources, and it didn't actually happen. And so we, we find this out from uh, a source, obviously, that is inside that boardroom, and that's Jeff Hobson. So, um, you know, in, in all honesty, until it happens, obviously, it's not going to happen. But I, I don't even, I, I'm not even counting Reggie Nelson out yet. Which was – I was actually going to bring that up here in a second, so – you know, at this point, I think we've gone through the first couple weeks of free agency, and everyone's getting picked up. I mean, picked up, picked, put down. Uh, everyone's being moved around, and everything here. You know, I still stand by my article I wrote a couple weeks ago, where I think it is Sean Williams' time to really step up and be that player. But I'm not mm-hmm. against the idea of bringing Reggie Nelson back, even though I basically all but guaranteed he was gone in that article. Um, I think a three-man rotation of Iloka, Nelson, and Sean Williams is not a bad thing. We've seen that success, obviously, for four or five seasons now. Um, I seem to like Williams a little more than I like Nelson. Obviously, the upside of youth, um, Mm -hmm. athleticism, strength, he certainly brings that to the table. Um, But Reggie Nelson, just football smarts-wise, I would certainly love to have him back on this team. Absolutely. And, and of course, it has to make sense for both sides, as we consistently say. But at the same time, why not? I mean, what... What argument would anybody have other than the whole Sean Williams deserves deserves his time? Because he does. But if you can get Reggie Nelson for, I'm not going to say a steal, but if you can get him for a reasonable price, whether it's a one- or two-year deal, he's been very valuable to this team. I mean, he's been part of this team, I want to say, most of his career. I might be wrong on that. but Yeah, all but like three or four seasons. I want to say I think it was three seasons. It was with Jacksonville. I think I, 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 I think I actually mentioned that in um, uh, which article? Oh, it was in um, the, the 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 Brandon LaFell article about how the Bengals have brought guys in after kind of having their worst seasons yeah, of their career did. and uh, bringing them in and all of a sudden having a revival. Yeah. So, and, and so. You know, and Adam Jones was another perfect example of that. But I think he's Reggie Nelson, example. yeah, he is. But Reggie Nelson is one of those. He had it at Jacksonville. I think he had seventy tackles. He had no interceptions. He had five pass deflections. He had no forced fumbles, and he was basically as other than tackles, which no offense, five when you have five uh, pass deflections, but you have seventy tackles. Obviously, the guy who you become responsible for is catching balls. Um, and so we saw that, and, and he had one of his worst seasons in Jacksonville. The Bengals took a chance on him, and he's been incredible. He has. Um, so, yeah, I think that that certainly makes things interesting there I uh, for that case as well. Uh, let's go ahead and reset here a little bit. This is Men in Stripes brought to you by StripeHype.com, a fan site has a site there for you. Um, you know, let's kind of touch a bit on the website this week. We've seen a lot of 
Uh, really cool articles out there. Dylan wrote an awesome one. Uh, Dylan, our co-editor, who is a Green Bay Packer fan, actually compares the Bengals and Steelers rivalry, saying it's better than the Green Bay Packers Chicago Bear article. So that's a really good article there. Um, yep. You've been on top yourself of everything going on in free agency and news covered there. So you've done a really good job there. I wrote probably my most depressing article I've ever written in my life, trying to compare the two postseason losses to the Steelers and which one hurts for. Still haven't decided that one yet. Um, I, I I definitely have, and that's so sick because I mean the sixteen was a freak freak thing, um, but oh six was one of those that a hit a low hit by the way on a quarterback, yep. which now is illegal. Okay. Um, even rolling is illegal, um, but uh, a low hit took out pretty much one of the better quarterbacks in the, that year in the league uh, in, in Carson Palmer. And then we threw in a, a second string quarterback who did okay, especially for the first couple of drives, and then just fell. And I mean, yeah. he fell off. And, and, you know, at least with, and with AJ McCarron, it was interesting because, you know, you think that, go, well, what's the difference AJ McCarron was in for Andy Dalton, but AJ McCarron, Excuse me, AJ McCarron also had four games under his belt mm-hmm. and had done fantastic in three of those. Yeah. And so, um, you know, really with that even, and you can even say five games if you want to go back to the, his first game when he came in for Andy Dalton because that was after, I think, the first series essentially. Yeah, I was there. Uh, but, but he did a fantastic job, and we see if he stays with the Bengals, what even the future could be. Obviously – He's going to have his opportunities elsewhere, the, right. and and we've heard that with, um, you know, the Bengals don't want to move him, and then all of a sudden, hold on, Mike Brown does his normal thing. Wait, you know, my guy said that that AJ McCarron is on sale, but you know what? Every player is available for the right price, and and no offense, and, and you know, as much as you know, we love this Bengals organization, and I think we can speak both on that, yep. but, um. I'm almost tired of Mike Brown consistently coming out and contradicting everything that the organization says. I am too. And it's almost a joke because it seems like he's out of tune with his own organization. What annoys me is like all the stories you hear about, like the draft day disagreements. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, we still hear about the Andy Dalton one when he wanted Mallet or he wanted Kaepernick and, oh, thank God those didn't happen. Yeah, well, Mallet for sure. Kaepernick would at least give you two good years. Yeah. So let's kind of uh, let's move around here a little bit. Let's touch on the rest of the uh, the league and some free agent moves that have happened here. Um, let's talk about the big one that came out today, man. So, Art- oh yes, Robert Griffin the third going to Cleveland. Is there anything more perfect of a story than Robert Griffin the third for the Cleveland Browns? Well, I think would have been more perfect is obviously Colin Kaepernick and them overpaying for Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. But with that being said, I mean, you know, kind of uh, a little bit of, of at least family stuff with the Browns for me. But mm-hmm. even with that, I saw a great post, and it had a um, a woman standing in the window wearing a Browns jersey, and it had couches. All the quarterbacks. And it had every single quarterback with a line through every single quarterback. And finally at the bottom it says RG3. Uh, And and so, you know, it's perfect. I mean, it's kind of this revolving door of of, of people and quarterbacks there. But, you know, Robert Griffin III, and and I've said this to anybody who has talked to me about football and, and talked to me about quarterbacks and and who I think is overrated at this point. And he just has never become comfortable again throwing on that front foot. And that's his issue. If he was a good quarterback until the ACL tear, and actually it may have been ACL and MCL, um, but until that tear, he was a good quarterback. He ran well. He, he was a great, he was great when he escaped the pocket um, had some uh, good decisions. I mean, Washington did very well with him before that injury. And he's just never been able to regain that confidence off that front foot. And maybe, maybe Cleveland brings in 
the quarterback whisperer, Tom House, especially since Hugh Jackson's there. Mm-hmm. But is he even going to be able to instill confidence in Robert Griffin III to throw off that front foot? Because nobody so far has been able to. I just find it funny that the two big guys from that year, from the Griffins' year, uh, as far as his rookie year, when they went, when Washington went to the playoffs and they had that run to get to the playoffs, are now gone in the span of two days, being Griffin and Alfred Morris. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Alfred Gold, Dallas, obviously, uh, we mentioned the last time we talked at DeMarco Murray not being there anymore, um, not going to Dallas. So Alfred Morris. I call that. <laughs> so Alfred Morris going in that spot, I don't mind that, honestly. Um, I like Alfred Morris a lot as a player, and I hope that now, you know, he'll get a little bit of better time. I like him and Darren McFadden as a duo. Um, so I think that's a pretty good spot for him, especially on just a two year deal. So I think he could definitely do some cool things there. Oh, that just means that Zeke falls a little further down the uh, draft board. He's going to be an Eagle man at this point. Cause they're talking about, they've already got rid of Murray. They're trying to get yep. rid of Ryan Matthews. Like yep. the Eagles are either going Carson Wentz or they're going uh, Zeke Elliott at this point. I think Carson Wentz will even be gone by then. I think he's going to Cleveland to second pick. You know, I actually think... Even with getting Griffin. I think... I don't know. I'm still on the board whether it's going to be Wentz or Goff. Um, And and I say that because Goff... No offense to Wentz. Goff has played in a Pac-12 league with NFL caliber players. North Dakota State, or was it North Dakota State that he's yeah. that Wentz is part of? Okay. Uh, North Dakota State is not an NFL ready no. quarterback destination. And and so granted, I understand and I think the knock on golf is that he doesn't he really hasn't lined up underneath a uh, center too much. Is that right? Something Am I thinking like the right that. person? And and so, you know, that may be the knock on him, but okay, that's a learn that's a learnable thing. Mm-hmm especially in the NFL and especially through training camps and everything like that. He is more NFL ready with the pressures of the NFL in terms of the defenses, what they're going to bring. He is more mentally adapted to the NFL and no offense to Wentz. Cause I'm not saying he's in, he's a dumb player, but I think golf is more mentally intelligent in, a, in an NFL setting at this point, especially if you're looking at him being competing for a starting role. And once I don't think it's. Um, I think we're, uh, I think you're selling one double A a little short there, honestly. You're right. I mean, um, <laughs> Carson Wentz isn't going against USC. He's not going against UCLA. Um, but, I mean, the kid can play. The kid's very talented. I think he's going to be a pretty good NFL football player. And it's not like these guys that come from this circumstance are exactly bad players. I mean, Joe Flacco, for how much I make fun of his career, has had a pretty decent NFL run. Um, you know, and that you know, happens. Uh, just, you know, scholarship situations coming out of high school, that can really play a part in that, too. Um, I like the upside of Wentz more than I like the upside of golf, honestly. I think that as far as the athleticism... Uh, being able to move in the pocket, scrambling when things break down, arm strength. Uh, he's probably he's not as accurate as golf, um, but size. You know, I think that he brings a little bit more in that circumstance than golf does. Well, and, and I understand that, but to the point too, I don't think the guys in division in, in uh, division one AA or whatever you want to call it um, F- is it FCS now? Was I wrong there? Yeah, it's FCS. Uh, yeah, FCS. Uh, I think my only issue with those guys is they aren't as fast as NFL ready players are, which you see in the FBS um, and what you see in, you know, your NCAA division one big programs, and, you know, and, and if you're facing in golf has faced guys from USC guys from uh, Oregon, these, these guys who are, NFL ready who are starting NFL defensive ends, defensive tackles. And he's seen the speed of the game. And granted, it's even a little faster in the NFL. And Wentz has it. And that's my fear with Wentz is his adjustment is going to have to come at the speed level. 
And yes, he gets he, he understands the pocket's collapsing, but there's a difference between a pocket collapsing and a five step drop and getting rid of the ball in in, in double A and, and having to go into a three step drop and get rid of the ball quickly in the NFL because you can't take that five step drop, especially with somebody like Cleveland, no offense to their offensive line, uh, but you know, obviously there's a reason no quarterback at this point has worked there. Mm-hmm. Um, but all in all, these guys are faster, stronger, bigger than what you see. And, and it's not to knock to say that the guys in one double A aren't NFL caliber, because there are some, some great players out there. Um, you name one, Joe Flacco, but even Joe Flacco had a curve. Yeah. And so, um, and he wasn't the best in his first season, if I remember. Oh, I guess he did make the playoffs, didn't he? Yeah, I'll never forget his first game was against the Bengals, and he killed him. But, but I mean, the one big thing there would be is you have Joe Flacco, a one in a million type guy too, um, you know, who's worked out very well. But we have so many more stories of one double A players that haven't worked out that we could have argued at that point in time that they were NFL ready. And so I think with Wentz, it's a more of a risk. Granted, Cleveland has been known to take these risks, mm-hmm. but they've also failed miserably many times. Plus, they've never had Hugh Jackson, I think, for him. Yeah, I mean, that helps, but at the same time, Hugh Jackson can only do so much. The player yeah. has to adapt, has to learn, and has to be willing to grow quickly. And that's that's still yet to be seen because he didn't go from a 1AA school into a Division One. Uh, big program like we've seen from other programs as well and, and other quarterbacks go and say you know what I'm going to take one more year I'm going to go to grad school I'm going to go and join another team in my last year of eligibility and and try to prove himself at that level to come out of the the uh at the NFL level yeah I think that's definitely fair there um sorry right, Matthew we got about a few more minutes so we can go um yep we, we ready to do this Let's do it. All right, let's do a little different this week, picking up, putting down. Let's name players and free agents that are currently free agents, and let's say if we think they're a good fit by picking them up or putting them down. You ready? Let's go. All right, let's start with the guys I've, started, I've written articles about recent futures. Let's start with Nick Fairley. Ooh, uh, Nick Fairley. Go ahead. I'll have to think about that one. I pick up, um, but not as a star, big-time, defensive big game-changer for this team. I think you put him in the role player there. You move him around with Pecco, since Pecco's kind of deteriorating in the age there. Um, mm-hmm. You kind of put him in there as a rotational guy. I think he's a really good asset to this team. Now, I don't think he's going to end up signing with the team, because I think he just met with New England. But if the circumstance presents, I would pick up bringing Nick Fairley to this team. One-year deal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it does it, – it makes sense. I think he's a good rotational guy. Again, somebody who would have to prove himself in that short-term deal type situation. I'm picking up – I'm picking up one-year deal. Um, obviously, you know, the, the New England thing kind of hurts. But at the same time, uh, we've seen New England meet with plenty of players, and they haven't signed them. All right. Hmm. All right, let's stick with the guys who are just rumored. Brandon LaFell. I'm picking up. I am picking up because I think last year was one of those distraction years. I think we saw uh, uh, what he can do in 2014 with a good quarterback. Andy Dalton is a good quarterback. And if he can get some space, if he can get some breakaway, uh, or if he can break away from a, a corner or find a way to undercut a corner and, and – you know, at least find a, a quick uh, slant type style. I think he could be successful, and and I think he gets past those drops. I think so too. I th- think in the right situation, having a good quarterback like Dalton, you said, is going to play a big part there. So I think that that's a I'll pick up that one also. Uh, hey, I'll keep it going. I'll pick up this one too. I'm going. I'm. I'll, let's stick with Carlos Dansby. I like the guy. Um, I think he would fit better than obviously Taylor Mays. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
we're finally going to have a disagreement for like the first time in three weeks. I know. Well, I think um, for a couple weeks, so. Yeah, well, you know, and then last week we seemed to agree on everything. Um, I think the age plays a huge factor. He's 34 years. And no offense, I think we already have one of him here with A.J. Hawk. True. Um, and so, again, A.J. Hawk, who's been in the system, or Carlos Dansby, who is learning a new system, I, I'm having to sit there and go, I'd rather see A.J. Hawk, who knows the plays and, and is sitting there going, okay, year two developed a little bit better. Let's see him go, especially when he has this opportunity now. So I'm putting it down. Okay, that's fair. Uh, I'll pick him up just strictly because I think that even at 34, he's still showing he can play at a high level. The AFC North is a very strong, tough division. He stood his own there on a, the worst team he could be on in that division. So, yeah, I think uh, I think he could definitely bring a little bit to the table. And uh, last one, you know, let's just make this a little easy. Let's just go through the guys we've talked about tonight. Wallace Gilberry. Um. I'm putting him down, and I'm not actually putting him down because I don't want to see him return. Wallace Gilberry is, I think, again, mindset, wants to be a starting defensive end, wants to be in a a system that he has a potential of being a starting defensive end. He doesn't see that here. Um, And and so I think it's more of a hindrance bringing him back just because I don't think he's happy here. Um, I think he likes the system. I think he would play in the system, but – at the same time, again, he wants to be a starter, and I think until he has that, that starting role or at least has a chance at that starting role, you're going to see somebody who's just unhappy in that system, and so I'm putting it down. I'm putting it down, too, strictly because I think that they're going to plan for Will Clark to be that guy that will play the strong and weak side end. I think mm-hmm. that they're going to kind of play game plan for him to be the guy that rotates with Johnson and Dunlap. And mm-hmm. um, much as I disagree, I still think they believe in Marcus Hunt a little too much. So yep. I don't expect to see Wallace Gilberry back with the Bengals, but I would like to see him back with the Bengals. Yeah, same thing here. Yeah, absolutely there. You have one you want to discuss before we get off air? Um, I think the big thing, obviously, um, would be one that we even talked about tonight again. Um, and this is – and from what I understand, we're doing it from both sides. You know, both players have to – player and team have to like each other to, or come back or at least want to come back. That's Reggie Nelson. I'll pick up. Um, I don't think last year was a fluke. I don't think last year was Reggie Nelson kind of like having a quick resurgence just to fall down again. I think that he fits perfectly into the system. I think Polly Gunther really trusts trust them here. And I think a rotation between those three with Darren Smith still playing a part on this team and really learning how to be a – that fourth safety, I think it's a great safety core to have with him, Iloka, Williams, and Smith. So I'll pick up. I, I'm picking up. I, I think, again, you know, with what you said, uh, I think it was more than just kind of a, a quick resurgence. I think he still has th- something left in the tank. Um, but at the same time, I think he brings a leadership aspect that we've seen, um, you know, we've, we've seen Iloka even benefit from i think sean williams you know kind of rotating him in playing a one-year contract rotating in uh sean williams to to really kind of learn that role underneath uh reggie nelson and um i i honestly think it would be kind of one of those great kind of player coaching type situations that you know give him a one-year deal let him let him play out and you know maybe he retires a Bengal, maybe he decides that he wants to play one more year after that but you know, at least at least bring him back and, and give him a, a shot to to retire a bangle. Yeah, I certainly agree there. All right, with that being said, we're going to close out this edition of Men in Stripes, brought to you by StripePipe.com. Matthew, thanks again. Always a pleasure for another strong week. And remember to email us at meninstripesh at gmail.com, your questions. Absolutely. We might make it a picking up or putting down segment even. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everyone. Enjoy the week as we get closer and closer to draft day. (gasps) And which you will be there. And yes, all of us are jealous. And maybe you'll get to meet our lovely new co-editor as he says he wants to go. So that'd be awesome. Never know. And we'll definitely need to bring uh, my plan is to bring Matt back as long as uh, 
uh, he is available. So uh, hopefully Matt will be joining me for draft night, and we can do something special for draft night. That'd be cool. Yeah, for sure. So, but definitely, thank you, Tim, for another great week. Thank you for coming back strong. Back. And uh, and uh, we, we will uh, definitely look forward to seeing everybody next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. Have a good time, everyone, and who day? Who day?